Okay, session 16, the final two chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. Chapters 33 and 34 is a very short one, actually. Chapters 30, chapter 33 is the blessing of the 12 tribes. And um, it's, it's, it's very parallel to a couple of other places, particularly Genesis 49. And uh, we'll take a look at that as we go a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. I visualize a parallel here where he had Jacob when he had his 12 sons around his deathbed. Well, or leaning on his staff, whatever. Here we have Moses obviously knowing and knowledge that he's, it's over. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. This is one of the very few allusions to the fact that when the law was given that there were the, the, um, the he came with tens of thousands of holy ones, uh, angels, whatever, and here translated saints. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. They sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun. There's that, that affectionate term of Israel again. When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Now, before we get into these, I thought it would be useful to refresh ourselves a little bit on the patriarchs or the twelve tribes. Obviously, uh, uh, under Abraham, he had Ishmael under Hagar, but then Isaac as the supernatural birth, the, the, the birth of promise under Sarah. He married Rebekah and had his son, had Jacob and Esau. And you remember how Jacob outmaneuvered Esau for the birthright? But in any case, it's from Jacob then that we have the 12 tribes. He married Leah and Rachel. He, loved, he wanted Rachel, got tricked, in effect, getting Leah. He served seven years for each of these. But uh, they went by quickly as far as he's concerned. He loved Rachel that much. But Leah was fruitful. She had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And of course, that's pretty rough on Rachel because she was not bearing at all. But Rachel gets an idea. She, there was a procedure in those days to give a handmaid, so she gives her handmaid, Bilhah, to Jacob as a substitute wife. And he, through her has Dan and Naphtali. And uh, Leah figures, gee, that's a pretty good maneuver. I'll do the same thing. So she takes her handmaid, Zilpah, gives it to Jacob, and has Gad and Asher. About this time, Rachel finally gets uh, deliverance, and she has her firstborn, Joseph. And Joseph becomes very favored, because Jacob loved Rachel so much, he favors Joseph, much to the chagrin of his other brothers. And you all know the story of the so-called variegated coat. It may have been multicolored. Some scholars believe it was just seamless. Who knows? But in any case, he was favored by a special coat. He was also younger, and he also has these dreams. You know the whole story of Joseph. Jo the story of Joseph itself is an incredible saga. Meanwhile, Leah has two more, Issachar, Issachar rather, and Zebulun. And uh, finally, Rachel has Benjamin, but dies in childbirth. And that makes Benjamin very, very especially uh, precious, but also upsets Jacob because it cost Jacob, Rachel, if you will. But uh, And then Joseph, by the way, when he's down in Egypt, has two sons of his own that get adopted by Jacob as his own. So they become, he adopts his grandson as his own. So you've actually got 14 names up here. And you can play with those to always get 12 tribes, even if you have reason to leave one or another out. But these are the so-called 12 tribes of Israel. The first four that were born to Leah, where if you read in Genesis 29, the occasion of the birth gives you an insight as to what the name was intended to mean. When Reuben was born, Leah was thrilled, behold a son. But actually, uh, there's more to it than that, and I'll come to that a little later. Um, uh, when Simeon's born, uh, the word heard is, is key to that. Levi was joined to. Judah meant praise. When Bilhah has Dan, it means Dan means judge. God is my judge or whatever. Naphtali means wrestling or struggles. Zilpah has then her next two is Gad, which can mean troop according to some authors, or luck or fortune by others. And uh, uh, in Genesis uh, 30 verse 13, when Asher is born, the word means happy. And uh, Leah has two more. Issachar means recompense or purchased. 
and Zebulun means exalted. And uh, Rachel, Joseph means Jehovah has added to her. And uh, when Benjamin, uh, ben, uh, 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 ben, uh, it was his son of grief, but then changed the son of my right hand. And uh, so those are the, what the names mean. Well, uh, the question of a succession gets, becomes an issue because Reuben would have been the firstborn. He'd be the natural heir, but he was disavowed because he had an illicit relationship with his father's concubine. And so Simeon and Levi have an incident at Shechem where they're so brutal in avenging Dinah's uh, 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 violation that it was so brutal that they were dis- somewhat discredited there. Judah is really the next in line. He becomes, he gets endowed with a, with a royal line, of course. Joseph is favored as the firstborn from Rachel's stock, and Jacob's favorite, which of course colors the whole history of Joseph and the animosity of his brothers and so forth. Well, let's go through these. As you go to Deuteronomy 33, verse 6, the first one that's going to be mentioned by Moses is, Let Reuben, let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. Well, if you study Reuben, he was the firstborn of Jacob by Leah, as I mentioned. His name is connected with the phrase, The Lord has looked upon my affliction, is what Leah actually says. Um, and, of course, his incestuous act with Bill, his father's concubine, gets him discredited. It was interesting that it was Reuben who advised his brothers not to kill Joseph, and he, turned to the pit, he returned to the pit to release him. But uh, they sold him, as you know. Uh, Reuben's forfeited birthright uh, was given to Joseph. And the tribe of Reuben is involved in the rebellion in the wilderness in number 16. But uh, in Genesis 49, when Jacob blesses Reuben, he says, He'll be unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel and have preeminence. That's some kind of blessing. It's really a prophecy, obviously. And uh, so that tribe was not, a, not, not aiming to excel. They unfortunately chose to settle on the east side of the Jordan. And that they weren't really part of the main action, if you will, and they were also among the first tribes to be conquered by the Assyrians then when, that, when the northern kingdom went into, into captivity. Now, prophecy of Moses here in Deuteronomy 33.6, it says, Let his men be few. It's interesting that the numbering in Numbers 1, they were about 46.5. They're one of the few tribes that did not increase by the second numbering. In Numbers 26, it was 43,700. Uh, so most of the others did increase, so they were less. It's interesting that there's no judge, no prophet, nor prince is found of the tribe of Reuben. So they conspicuously indistinguished, if you will. Well, let's move to the next one. Verse 7 of Deuteronomy 33. This is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. Judah, thou art... uh, Now, let let, let me contrast. That's what Moses said. I'm going to insert here what Jacob had said back in Genesis 49 in a similar situation. Jacob prophesies over Judah. He says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. There's a play on words there. Judah means praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. So you'll be part of the royal line here. Judah's a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down and couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now here's the most... Verse 10 is a very, very critical verse. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. That's a messiah, meaning the Messiah. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. There's a very interesting story. Um, Herod Archelaus was uh, discredited, called back, taken, uh, called back to, to Venice, which is a city in Gaul at those days. And, uh, and, and the Romans installed in lieu of the Herodian kings then Caponius as a procurator for the region. And Cap- one of the first things Caponius did in about uh, 6 or 7 BC, uh, AD, excuse me, um, was to um, remove their right to capital punishment. And uh, there's a whole story behind that that's well documented in Josephus, both his books, the Antiquities of the Jews and also the Wars of the Jews. But they both have, bear on this. But what's interesting was when the, the Sanhedrin lost the power to uh, administer capital punishment, that was to them when the scepter had departed from Judah. And the priests put on sackcloth and ashes and went, marched around the city of Jerusalem. This is all recorded in the Babylonian Talmud and elsewhere. 
that uh, and they we wailed, uh, woe is me that the the that the word of God has been broken. They actually felt that the word of God had been broken because the scepter had departed from Judah and the Shiloh had not come, the Messiah had not come. What they didn't know was while they were doing that, up in Nazareth there was a young boy in a carpenter shop. In fact, in a sense, awaiting the day, the very specific day that Daniel had been told by Gabriel the Messiah would present himself riding a donkey in Jerusalem. So if they had done their homework, they would have known that the Messiah was extant. And uh, there were some that did, by the way. You may recall there's Anna and a couple of situations where they knew that the Messiah was about to make his appearance. And Jesus in Luke 19 held them accountable to know the very day that he was riding the donkey. So in any case, it, it, this is a very, verse 10 is a very interesting verse. And there's a lot more to it. I'm giving you the summary of it. Let's go to verse 11. Binding his fold in the vine, his ass is cold into the choice vine. Uh, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Well, that's Judah. His name means praise. The root means to praise. Uh, he intercedes, by the way, for Joseph's life. When the brethren were about to kill him, it's Judah that proposes a sale to keep him alive, at least sale him to the, Ish uh, to the Ishmaelites. Uh, he unknowingly has incest with Tamar's daughter-in-law, thinking you know, she was, in a sense, disguised as a harlot, that whole tawdry thing in Genesis 38. Um, he was loyal to the house of David at the time of the revolt of the Ten Tribes in 1 Kings 12, very important time. He led the first division of Israel on their journeys in Numbers 10. He was commissioned of God to lead in the conquest of the promised land in Judges 1 and 4. And, of course, Judah made David the king from the tribe, so that's important. Let's go on to Levi, Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. And of Levi he said, Let thy Thummim and Urim be thy holy one, be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and whom, with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. So the Levites, of course, have these, we, it's a mystery. No one's quite sure. There's all kinds of theories. No one's quite sure what the Urim and the Thummim, they're usually put in the other order here, by the way. But anyway, uh, as a means of discerning God's, it's a, a leading direction on certain critical issues. And who, who said unto his father, <coughs> pardon me, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee, and the whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him, and of them that hate him, that they rise not again. The Levites, very militant group, by the way, very militant group in their history. The name is linked with the root to join or to be attached to. Uh, of course, they they were very they they avenged the seduction of uh, Dinah in pretty brutal terms. They, their zeal against idolatry was the reason they were appointed to be the priests. That's in Exodus 32 and echoed, of course, in uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 33, but also Malachi too. And uh, they were exempt from enrollment for military duty. They were subordinate to the sons of Aaron. The Aaron, sons of Aaron were the priests. Not all Levites were priests, understand that. They had to be a direct lineage of, of Aaron. They were teachers of the law all through the scriptures. They were judges all through the scriptures. And they also were the special guards of the person and the house of the king in times of danger. Second Kings 11, Second Chronicles 23, and so on. Well, let's, to, let's move on to Benjamin. And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. And the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And many scholars have you know, put the, the whole idea of, of um, the uh, Temple Mount being between the Mount Zion and Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives as being the shoulders. There are some people that feel that there's a, an illusion to that. But in any case, uh, Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob. He's called the son of my right hand by his father. And uh, Jacob, in his prophecies in Genesis 49, called, he said, Benjamin, this is a ravenous wolf. And he's a pretty aggressive guy, as you may recall from the business of the book of Judges. He was no, the Benjaminites were known as being ferocious. They in, in, uh, earned a high reputation for bravery and skill in war. And they were uh, uh, 
infamous in terms of their ability with left-handed slings. You may recall from Judges 3 and Judges 20. The notable heroes from the tribe of Benjamin would include Ehud. Remember, he delivered the Israel from the Moabites very early in the book of Judges. Obviously, Saul, the first king, came from Benjamin. Queen Esther came from Benjamin. And the Apostle Paul, another Saul, if you will, but I'll call him here the Apostle Paul, uh, was also a Benjamite, Romans 11.1 and so forth. So Benjamin, Benjamin is a small tribe, but a uh, good reputation. Now we get to, a, there are a lot of words about Joseph. Joseph gets quite a, a rundown here. Deuteronomy 33, verse 13. As of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills. And for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwell in the bush. And let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him who is separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns like the horns of the unicorn. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they that are ten thousands of Ephraim, and they that are the thousands of Manasseh. Kind of interesting, Manasseh was actually the older, the firstborn. But you may recall when, when uh, Jacob, the, the, the grandfather, so to speak, was called to bless them, he crossed his hands, much to the consternation of Joseph. And he crossed his hands when he blessed the two sons of Joseph, his grandsons. And he gave the favored position to Ephraim, who was actually younger than Manasseh. A, a twist, if you will, on the phrase of the firstborn. And Ephraim does, Manasseh ends up, when they conquer the land, Manasseh, half of them uh, li, uh, choose to stay east of the Jordan, the other half uh, go in, into the land. Ephraim grows to become the dominant tribe of the northern kingdom. And uh, uh, often, often the word Ephraim is used as a synonym, or technically as a synecdoche, of the northern uh, kingdom. And uh, often... It, it, in, uh, in the scripture, it would say Ephraim, meaning the whole bunch. So we have Joseph. Name means may God add sons, implies addition. He's the firstborn of Rachel, Jacob's loved wife. He was favored by his father, but then he was despised by his brothers, sold into slavery, but then exalted through the, through the intrigues in Egypt, if you will, to become prime minister of the world at that time. And uh, there are over a hundred ways that the life of Joseph can be looked upon as a prophecy of Jesus Christ. I'm indebted to Arthur W. Pink's list. I've added a few of our own, but uh, they're listed in many of our materials, our commentaries on uh, Genesis, um, and uh, uh, they're also listed in, our, in some of our books and so forth. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's really quite extensive. It's quite surprising as you look at the details. Well, the tribe of Joseph really has two halves, if you will, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim was a second son of Joseph, but put into the firstborn position. He was adopted by Jacob, but blessed before Manasseh, so he's the principal one. He was the leading tribe of the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And uh, Manasseh means making me forget. And forgetfulness has uh, made me forget my toil and so forth. He's the first son of Joseph and Manasseh. That's apparently what... That was see the first son that Joseph had when he was alienated. He was in Egypt. So having this son helped him forget all his troubles and, of the past. And so uh, that's why, what Manasseh apparently suggests, forgetfulness or whatever. But he, of course, was adopted by Jacob as one of the uh, uh, tribal thing. Now, this tribe was renowned for its valor on the one hand, they did, Gideon in the west and Jephthah in the east in the, in the book of Judges. But their inheritance, he took half the tribe, took east of the Jordan in Numbers 32, and the other half went west of the Jordan in Joshua 16. So you all be here, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were the east of the Jordan, see. Okay, let's go to Zebulun. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. So we're talking seacoast people here. And trades with Tyre and Sidon. In Genesis 49, Jacob had prophesied over Zebulun, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of the ships, and his border shall be unto Sidon. 
Tyre and Sidon were Phoenicia. They were the primary maritime trading cultures. And so Zebulun's proximity to that uh, was very beneficial in terms of them becoming traders and, and maritime um, dealers, if you will. Now in Galilee, that's to the north uh, of Issachar and south of Asher and of Naphtali between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean. And so uh, that's the area they're in. Now it's interesting, this can be looked at as a prophecy that, that, that part of Galilee would enjoy a large share of our Lord's public ministry. You can go through some of the prophecies of Zebulun, and it seems it would, from Isaiah 9, verse 12, and compare that with Matthew 4, and you can get the impression that it's the, it's the area of Zebulun that has the benefit of being the primary region that uh, uh, Zebulun is active in. Issachar, ninth son of Bileah. It comes from the Hebrew word sekari, which means my hire, or recompense. And uh, she actually, <laughs> she actually uh, it had to do with the uh, uh, dealing between Leah and Rachel. She was hired, in effect. And, uh, now, it's interesting that the prophetic blessing pronounced by Jacob corresponds with that of Moses from Genesis 49, verse 14, 15, and, and Deuteronomy 13, 33, 18, 19. It's interesting that only Judah and Dan are stronger uh, than the Issachar is a strong group. They started with 64.3 at the first numbering in Numbers 26. First Chronicles 7.5, they're up to 87,000. So they're a strong bunch. And when they talk numbers, by the way, they're talking only the men that go to war. No, no children, no women, and no men over whatever it is, 50, I guess. The richest portion of the whole land was the Jezreel Valley, was Issachar. The area that's just you know, south, uh, east of uh, Haifa, if you will. Okay, now we get to Gad. And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And he provided the first part for himself, because there in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated, and he came with the heads of the people and executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. So seventh son, Avinder Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, brother of Asher, his name means fortune or luck. Some would say it means troop. Uh, different scholars have different views. This, uh, his tribe was very fierce and warlike. And uh, they were the strong men of might, men of war uh, for battle that could handle shield and buckler, the faces, the faces of lions, and the rows upon the mountains of the swiftness. That's First Chronicles 12. And also chapter 5, 19 is the way they're described. Elijah was said by some scholars to be of this tribe. I, I can't find anyone that can tell me what a Tishbite is, but he did, he did leave up, live up in Gilead, and this was where Gad lived, so some assume that Elijah was of this tribe. But it's easy to confuse the region that the tribe inherited versus people who live there are not necessarily of that tribe. So it gets a little tricky. I often harass some uh, the Jewish scholars by saying, prove to me Elijah was Jewish. He can't do that. Well, he's a Tishbite. Yeah, well, what's a Tishbite? You know? So anyway, okay. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp, he shall leap from Bashan. Now what on earth does that mean? The tribe of Dan what, what drew lots down in the south, but it wasn't adequate, so they themselves moved up way up into the north area, which is close to the area of Bashan. So that may be what it refers to, or it may be spookier, we don't know. Jacob had prophesied of Dan, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. An adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backward. Now that's a weird set of idioms there. But it has led to a rabbinical uh, conjecture that the Antichrist will be out of the tribe of Dan. So that you'll hear that a lot. And also Dan is not mentioned in Revelation 7. It's the tribe that's not mentioned in the list. We'll come to that in a little bit. Dan was the first tribe... He is the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. The, uh, the idols up in the north, the golden calf, and the, uh, if you go up there to um, uh, what they call Banias, that's because the Arabs mispronounced Panias. It was, the, it was a Greek uh, region uh, d dedicated to the god Pan and called Panias, and the Arabs call it Banias, and so now you'll find on world signs B-A-N-A-I-S. It's, it's this corruption of the original name, but any, or earlier name. But And that region, of course, is, the, is where the tribe of Dan also lived. And that's where idolatry makes its first entrance into the land under Jeroboam. 
And uh, now it's interesting, this, uh, I didn't believe this when I first ran into it, but I checked it out and it's really too. The tribe of Dan seems to be given the backhand by the Holy Spirit through the whole Bible in some strange ways. If you look in the genealogies in Genesis 46, 23 and Numbers 26, 42, you'll discover they go systematically go through all the tribes with their sons when they get to Dan and others. <laughs> Doesn't list them. Uh, there's a term, Yushushim, there's a couple of names that some people think are names. No, they're not names. They're a way of saying and others. And so the names of, the names of Dan, where everybody else has their sons mentioned, in those particular genealogies, Dan doesn't. In First Chronicles, first ten chapters, there's detailed chrono, uh, you know, genealogies. You discover Dan doesn't show up at all. In Revelation 7, He's well known. Revelation 7, you've got, we'll, come, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you've got, in Revelation 7, you've got the 144,000 detail, 12,000 from each of 12 tribes. If you go through the list of 12 tribes, you'll discover Dan ain't there. How can you have 12 tribes? Well, you've got, you know, you've got 13 to choose from, but we, you know, we've been through that, right? So you can always leave one out, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But anyway, Dan is, he's, the name's brought it out. In other places, he's listed, Numbers 10 and, and uh, Joshua 19, and First Chronicles 27, in the list of things going on, he's always the last. So you do get the impression the tribe of Dan is, seems to be singled out editorially by the Holy Spirit. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. That's the blessing of Naphtali. He's the fifth son of Jacob, second one born by Rachel's handmaid, Bilhah. And he was the full brother of Dan. Genesis 30, verse 7 is all that stuff. Now, it's in, when at, at his birth, Rachel is said to have exclaimed, um, Wrestlings of God, mighty wrestlings have I wrestled. In other words, it's her handmaid that's delivering it, but Rachel's, you know, in effect, uh, delighted with the, uh, you know, that, that, again, she has one to her credit, so to speak. But it was apparently a pretty rough birth. Jacob prophesies over Naphtali. He's a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. And he, en he ends up getting the north and northwest of the Sea of Galilee, the area of Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, obviously also a scene of much of the Lord's ministry. And uh, indeed, he giveth goodly words. Deuteronomy 33, verse 24 and 25. And of Asher, he said, Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. The oil it's referring to is olive oil. That was the primary um, uh, symbol of wealth in, 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 in that era. Olive oil. There have been a number of Christian investors that have been fleeced, apparently by saying, using this verse as a basis, they're going to discover petroleum deposits in the area of Asher. And uh, I've heard all kinds of rumbles, but I also don't see any of them in the, in the, in the uh, oil industry journals. I see, uh, so I, 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 it's my understanding that there's been a lot of uh, more promises than substance in that, in, in, in that direction. I believe this is referring to olive oil, which indeed in that world was very precious, very important. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass as thy days, so shall thy strength be. So Asher. Now Jacob earlier had said, Out of Asher his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Well, he settled in the northern part, from Mount Lebanon to the Mediterranean. And, 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 and so royal dainties, workmen and materials for the temple. To David in 2 Samuel 5, and to Solomon in 1 Kings 5. Because this is where we have the cedars of Lebanon and all the other things needed for all the big building projects to the south. And he shall yield royal dainties. How interesting. It's interesting that in 2 Chronicles 30, that Asher kept the Passover under Hezekiah. And that was somewhat in contrast to the others. They had some leadership there. And by the way, incidentally, to this tribe belonged the prophetess Anna in Luke chapter 2. You may recall she was expectant of the Messiah in a very, very precious way. So now there's one I was going to ask you. Well, I, 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 I went up here too quickly. I was going to ask you, who's missing? Moses has now gone through all the tribes. There's one tribe he doesn't mention. And that, of course, is Simeon. He isn't there. Well, he was the second son of Jacob by Leah. He was associated with Levi in the terrible act of vengeance against Hamor and the Shechemites in Genesis 34. 
He's the one that was detained by Joseph in Egypt as a hostage, you may recall, in Genesis 42. So it's interesting that his father, Jacob, when he was dying, pronounced a malediction against him to be divided and scattered. And it's interesting, it was, that's what uh, Jacob had prophesied against Simeon. And it's interesting that in the wilderness wanderings, the tribe of Simeon decreased by two-thirds. If you compare Numbers 1 with Numbers 26. The number gradually dwindles, and the tribe seems to sink into insignificance. Its region was in, in this, it was roughly southwest of Jerusalem and gets commingled with Judah, if you will. Very often you'll hear of Judah in contrast to the ten tribes. Well, Judah is only one tribe, but it sort of gets mingled with both Benjamin, which is small, and Simeon, which is sort of diffuse. So if you take Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin, they constitute the southern kingdom, and there's ten other tribes in the north. You with me? I know the, uh, the, 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 numer the numerics get a little confusing. Now, it's interesting, Moses pronounces no blessing on this tribe, and it's interesting, though, they did not lose their identity, because in 1 Chronicles 4, there are 13 Simeonite princes that are listed there in the days of Hezekiah. So they, they haven't been prominent, but they haven't disappeared. They're still around as at least as a tribal identity, if not a, a, a cohesive political aspect of it. So let's continue. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell safely alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine, and his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. So ends that chapter. Now we have one short uh, before we have one short chapter to go to finish the session, but I want to talk a little bit more about these twelve tribes because there's some other aspects to it. Uh, you may, as I just re review, we had Leah had their four. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Then Bilah had Dan and Naphtali. And then Zilpah had Gad and Asher. And then Leah had two more, Issachar and Zebulun. And then finally Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. So that's, that's the, that is the list of seniority pretty much. Usually you have Leah's children, then Rachel's children, and then the children of the handmaids. That's a very common order. The 12 tribes are listed in the scripture 20 times. Each time they're in a different order, sort of, and, or some one or other is, is omitted. In Genesis 29 through 35, we have the origin of the natural order of the 12 sons. In 46, we have them entering Egypt. In 49, we have Jacob's blessing that we've been talking about. In Exodus, in entering Egypt, we have them listed. In this case, Joseph is omitted because he's already in Egypt, of course. In Numbers... We have their leaders with Levi omitted. Then the first sentence of Levi omitted because the Levites are sort of a special case. In, in uh, Numbers 2, you have the order of the camp. And uh, then you have order of offerings, order of march. Then you have the spies in, in uh, chapter 13 of Numbers. This, and Levi, by the way, is omitted from the spies. He had 12, he had 12 spies, but Levi is not among them. In 26, you have the second census, and against Levi is omitted in the second census. And then uh, in chapter 34, the dividing of the land. The eastern tribes then are admitted, because you're talking about dividing the west, if you will. In Deuteronomy, you've got the blessings and the cursings, as we talked about in chapter 27. The blessings of Moses we've just gone through, where Simeon is omitted, strangely enough. The order there apparently is geographical. Benjamin is before Joseph and so on. But uh, in Joshua, we have the allocation of territories, and they're in four groups to furnish cities for four classes of priests and so forth. Uh, in Judges, we have uh, the Song of Deborah. There, Judah and Simeon are omitted. In First Chronicles, you have genealogies where Zebulun is omitted, and Dan is maybe or maybe not in verse 7, this issue. And uh, Chronicles 12 and 27, the officers under David, where Gad and Asher are omitted in First Chronicles 27. In Ezekiel chapter 48, you have kingdom divisions and the millennium, and you have all of that. And Revelation, you got the sealing of the 12,000 from each tribe. And, of course, as I've mentioned before, the tribe of Dan is omitted there, subject of a great deal of discussion in Revelation 7. Let's just take one of these. 
There's Revelation 7. You have Judah, 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, 12,000 from Gad, 12,000 from Asher, 12,000 from Naphtali, 12,000 from Manasseh, 12,000 from Simeon, 12,000 from Levi, 12,000 from Issachar, 12,000 from Zebulun, 12,000 from Joseph, 12,000 for Benjamin. Name two tribes that are not on that list. The tribe of Dan is not there, right? That's well known. There's another tribe that's missing. Huh? Ephraim, good for you. It's actually there, but by the back of the hand. Ephraim was the other tribe that, in which idolatry entered the land. And it's interesting, we have Ephraim here, but it's sort of strange. You see, you've got Manasseh mentioned, and then you've got Joseph. Well, you've taken Manasseh already counted. What's left of Joseph is Ephraim. You follow me? So Ephraim's there, but it's not listed. <laughs> Weird, huh? It gets worse. Each one of these names has a meaning. The meanings are kind of variable depending on how you go back and when they're born and why they're named. So there's, 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 there's a lot of scholastic agreement on some of the meanings. But if you take the common, commonly rendered ones, Judah means praise. Reuben means he, he looked upon my affliction. Anyway, if, you, if you, you could read the meanings of these names, praise the Lord, he has looked upon my affliction and granted good fortune. Happy am I. My wrestling has made me forget my sorrow. God hears me, he has joined me, he purchased me and exalted me by adding to me the son of his right hand. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? Now, is that, it's not hard and tight like my thing that I like to do on Genesis 5. But I will give you this thing, just you might find it fun to play around. You can go through and create a little inventory of the various meanings of the words, and then go look at the 20 lists, and you'll discover each, one, each list is in a different order with different things omitted. And uh, see if you find anything really provocative in those lists. I'll leave that to you as your little exercise as we go on to finish the session. Deuteronomy chapter 34, the death of Moses. This is a short chapter, but it'll wrap up the whole thing. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab, Unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead, unto Dan, that's way up north, and Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of the palm trees, unto Zor. And the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. That hasn't kept people from trying to find it. You've got all kinds of characters that have, you know, dug up half of Jordan, I guess, trying to find some evidence. But, uh, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. There's lots of scholars that have an argument between this and I cannot go out and come in. So on the one hand, apparently he's getting old. When he said he was 120, I can understand that. Yet here it says his natural force abated. So apparently... Uh, whatever it is, he's not in bad shape, but he's still, he's, he, he died of old age. <laughs> and the children of Israel swept for Mo, wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. So that was as it should be. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants and to all his land, and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. You know, there's never been a prophet like Moses until Christ. And it's really interesting that as you uh, uh, look at John 1, and John the Baptist is uh, baptizing uh, in, in near Jericho, in the waters of the Jordan, 
Now understand, that's only about 20 miles from Jerusalem. There were so many people from Jerusalem attending these meetings out by the Jordan that the temple authorities send an inquiry team to find out what on earth's going on. And when they go there to find out, asking John, who are you, there were three expectations that were evident in the crowd in, the, in, in those times. Are you the Christ? He says, I am not. Are you uh, uh, Elijah? He says, I am not. Are you that prophet? And what's not clear, unless you have some background, that prophet means the prophet. They were also expecting a prophet like Moses. So they're expecting the Messiah, some of them. Some were expecting Elijah return, because from Malachi 3 and Malachi 4. And some of them were expecting a prophet from Moses, from Deuteronomy 18, and so on. And, and, jo and, and John Baptist says, I'm, I'm not a, none of those. I'm a crier in the wilderness, and so on. So in any case, the prophet like Moses, um, it's, um, it's interesting that the Torah, not only the book of Deuteronomy, but the Torah ends on a prophetic note. We've had these heavy, heavy, uh, judgmental uh, pronouncements by God and predictions how Israel's going to fail on the one hand, but we never lose sight throughout the whole book that despite all of that, God is going to be gracious and God will bring them back together and they will ultimately be blessed. And they are to look forward when another Moses, if you will, will uh, be given to Israel. So that day, of course, arrives when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, becomes as a servant, the very Son of God, surpassing even Moses. And that's what the book of Hebrews hammers that Jesus is even, even above Moses. It's hard you, for, to really know what that means. You have to understand how venerated Moses is, a, is and should be. And yet Christ, of course, is far higher than that. It's interesting that Israel culminates centuries of failure, centuries of rebellion against God, and yet, and, and, and rejecting his gracious offer. Rejecting his offer at Kadesh Barnea, but they still ultimately get back in the land. They reject the, Jesus Christ, their Messiah, in, in, in his first coming, but the day will come when they'll get a second chance and will accept him, and that, that will be, in fact, a prerequisite condition to the second coming, as Hosea chapter 5 highlights at the last verse. And uh, so the, it's interesting that the song of Moses that we've just gone through points to the day when the offer will be accepted by Israel. Just as Stephen tried to point out in Acts 7 how they always blow it the first time, they make it the second time. They blew it the first time, but they'll make it the second time, albeit after great tribulation. And God will heal and avenge his people. Now it's interesting, there's one last thing we talk about. It's more of a mystery than a revelation for you. There is this strange little passage in the book of Jude, this little short one chapter book just before the book of Revelation written by the Lord's blood brother, Jude. Um, James and Jude were both brothers of Christ, both came to faith after the resurrection and so forth. In Jude's fascinating little letter, he is making the point rather intensely that we should not um, uh, mistreat dignitaries. We should respect rank. We should not make light of dignitaries. But he picks as an example to make his point what has to be the weirdest example you can imagine. The dignitary he picks to make his point is Satan. You've got to be kidding. But Jude says, yet even Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Durst not bring against him railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. In the context of his letter, what, what Jude is saying, that even Michael, the archangel, when he was contending with Satan over the body of Moses, he didn't bring against him some kind of railing accusation. He said, The Lord rebuke you. What Jude is saying is, you don't mess around with dignitaries, even the evil ones. You see? And so, uh, even Mike, now, now, now what, he, what Jude is drawing upon is apparently some understanding that his readers had that we've lost. We have no idea what he's talking about. 
And you can search, you can find all kinds of conjectures from strange places, but none of them really are that, uh, you know, I'm somewhat underwhelmed with the ones I've heard of. No, no one really knows what on earth's going on here. But apparently, Michael the archangel was contending with Satan. Now there is a misleading book put out by Koch many, many years ago, uh, Between Christ and Satan. It's a book about demonology, and the title, the book's a good book, but the title is unfortunate because you get the impression that Christ and Satan are somehow contending. No. Christ is the creator God. Christ created Satan. There's no contest between Christ and Satan. There can be a contest between two angels, two super angels. Satan was at one time in charge of all of them. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. Michael the archangel. There's only, we only know three, I think, only know the names of three of the super angels. Satan, of course, is Lucifer, or whatever. Satan means accuser. I guess his original name was Lucifer or something like that. Michael, who is always a military commander on behalf of God's people, typically Israel. And Gabriel, who's always on an annunciation. He's always there to communicate something about the Messiah. Every, Old Testament, New Testament, that's always what he's about. But apparently Michael, the archangel, is a military combatant and he is the, he, he, he's, he's not to be messed with. You don't mess around with angels. But Michael is contending with the devil, Satan. What is he contending about? I have no idea. He's talking about the body of Moses. What on earth is going on here? Who cares? The body is dust to dust, isn't it? Weren't we created out of dust and we go dust we return? The scripture on that, right? And uh, but for some reason, the body of Moses has a destiny that's unique enough that Michael is guarding it. What for? Well, we see Moses in Matthew 17 in bodily form. It's not, there's no reason to believe it's his resurrection body because the resurrection hasn't happened yet. Even Christ's resurrection hasn't happened yet in Matthew 17. The transfiguration. But at that transfiguration, the inner three, Peter, James, and John, were treated to this bizarre incident where the Lord is transfigured. And then who shows up? Moses and Elijah. With the, a lot of mysteries here. What kind of bodies do they have? They can't be resurrection bodies. Christ is the first fruits. He hasn't had his resurrection body yet. Are you with me so far? See, the more you study this, the more, more enigmas it raises. The other problem is, how did they, the three disciples, recognize Moses and Elijah. They'd never met him. But they knew who it was. Did they have name cards? <laughs> you know? Now Elijah being there doesn't surprise us because he didn't die. He was transported along with Enoch, right? There's two guys in the Old Testament that didn't die. They went directly to heaven somehow. That doesn't mean they won't get in a resurrection body when the time comes. The Ocaterian, that the Greek phrase is. But Moses is an interesting mystery because he dies, he's buried, and he does show up in Matthew 17. And probably, in my opinion, uh, Revelation 11. I happen to believe, for a number of reasons I won't bore you with in this tirade, that, um, that uh, the two witnesses in, in, in uh, Revelation 11 are Moses and Elijah. And the reason I say that is very simple is that the, there are four powers that are specifically enumerated in Revelation 11 for those two witnesses. They, and they, they call down fire from heaven. They turn water into blood. They uh, bring all kinds of plagues. And they can shut the heavens so it doesn't rain. Two of those were unique to Moses. Two of those were unique to Elijah in their ministry. In fact, shutting the heavens is described, we all know that Elijah caused it to rain after having shut it for three and a half years. In the Old Testament you don't find out, but in the New Testament it's twice it's mentioned that he's the one that shut the heavens in the first place. For how long? Three and a half years. How long do the witnesses have their power in Revelation? Three and a half years. It all starts to fit too tightly, in my judgment, for it not to be clearly God's fingerprints on this. Well, for Elijah to be there in Revelation um, 11 is no surprise. That's why so many people think it's Enoch and Elijah, but see, I don't think Enoch's there at all for lots of other reasons, but uh, for that reason. But, but, uh, but for Moses to be there starts to echo back to Jude 9. Is that why somehow his body was 
subjected to some special jurisdiction by Michael? Is that, does that somehow link to Matthew 17, the transfiguration, and Revelation 11, the two witnesses? I don't know. I don't know. But there is some spooky stuff to this. Um, dust as, is the symbol of man's mortality. From dust we come and dust we return. And it, it echoes in my mind that in Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15, where God is declaring war on Satan. Verse 15 is the, the seat of the woman passage we all know so well. Verse 14 is speaking to the serpent. He says, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I wonder, is there some mystical linkage between the serpent and, the, and dead bodies? I don't know. And whatever it might have been, it apparently suspended by Michael's intervention with Satan regarding the body of Moses so that that body, in some sense, could be available for Matthew 17, short of giving Moses a resurrection body ahead of Christ, who's the first fruits. You follow what I'm saying? So there may be far more going on here. It certainly uh, 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 gives you some opportunity to do some research. And uh, so, be that as it may, thus endeth the lesson. Thus ends our survey of the book of Deuteronomy, the book that Jesus quoted from more than any other book of the Bible. A precious, precious book, a collection of sermons. If they were New Testament books, you'd call them epistles because they're really written, they're really sermons, admonitions, encouragements by Moses in his final years after an incredible career. You can't think of many careers that equal Moses' career or his impact on the planet Earth in general, let alone for the Jews. Interesting, interesting book. So that ends the Torah, the five books of the Bible that are probably the most venerated portion of Scripture, um, certainly by the Jews, but I think should be by Christians also. It's very, very special laying the ground of God's plan of redemption. We've gone through uh, the Torah. We understand, obviously, the book of Genesis is one of our favorites, but Book of Exodus, the plan, the, 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 where the nation itself was born. God created this nation to be the vehicle through which His plan of redemption would um, occur. We get to the book of Leviticus, which is a book that's tragically skipped by so many, yet it's the, some people would argue, some scholars argue it's the most important book of the Bible because it's the only book that focuses on God's holiness. Most of us have no grasp of the solution to the problem because we don't understand the problem. Here's a God that loves us, that also will not violate His holiness, a basic attribute, which means that all our shortcomings have to be paid for. And God created us knowing that this predicament would occur, but loving us that much that He provided the most extreme um, program for our redemption, in which the death of God Himself would avail to pay the price to remove this predicament that he has where he wants to love us and have fellowship with us and yet uh, cannot be confronted by our unholiness. And uh, he does that all through the gift, commitment, I'll say achievements, of his son Jesus Christ. That's the program from cover to cover. The whole Bible has its roots in uh, the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament, that we've just highlighted and completed. And climaxes, of course, not in the Gospels, not in the crucifixion. Those are just means to an end. That's where Christ paid the price. But the big finish is the book of Revelation, the closing of the escrow, where Christ is presented with the title deed to the earth and takes possession of that which he purchased and brings all things in heaven and in earth, once again under subjection to the Creator God, and brings, brings back order to the disorder that was brought about through sin, the sin of Satan and the sin of man. And uh, incredible, incredible saga that uh, we will spend an eternity trying to fully understand. And uh, what a precious thing we have in the Scripture itself, that we have all this before us, and I challenge you that every time you go through it, 
We've gone through it, okay, once. Every time you go through it, new relationships will leap out at you. New insights will occur in this tapestry that we call the plan of redemption of God. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. The book of Deuteronomy was a book of love, a loving God that desires us in response to Him to love Him wholeheartedly. All the rules, all the admonitions, all the uh, everything in the book is nothing more than ways for us to demonstrate to God that we really understand how much He loves us. It's a book of love. Let's bow our hearts.